Well, uh, I guess that uh, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is a, a combination of words that probably most people that deal with fire safety engineering uh, don't seem to be able to understand how they can exist together. Uh, they, you know, talking about passion, they create all sorts of reactions from people, and uh, many times negative reactions, and they create all sorts of odd questions, and many times we can really not answer. So, I mean, if I just simply start by using the word cost, uh, one of the biggest swear words in anything that is associated to safety is saying, I am doing this to reduce the cost of a building. The moment a fire engineer admits that he's taking fireproofing to make a building cheaper, then all of a sudden he becomes a criminal. No? You know, the moment we decide that we're not going to put sprinklers because they cost too much, then all of a sudden we're idiots. And the use of the term cost, which, you know, it is an inherent aspect of being an engineer, is what makes the difference between us and scientists. The fact that we actually have to operate with a cert of certain limited resources to deliver an optimal solution is completely forgotten because we're dealing with safety. You know, we're dealing with safety, and therefore, when we actually try to do cost reduction, if we actually cut costs, we are immediately murderers. You know, we're killing people. You know, I cannot believe that you're taking this out and basically preventing people's safety. And, and the question that we really need to ask ourselves is, is actually real? I mean, is this actually a real question that we should be asking ourselves? Or is it an absolute absurdity to think that because we're trying to optimize the cost of, of infrastructure or the cost of safety, that we're actually becoming criminals and we are basically destroying all the morals behind our profession? And the truth is that, you know, when, when a structural engineer thinks of the idea of reducing the cost of a building, he's not perceived as a criminal. You know, when a mechanical engineer reduces the weight of a car to make it financially viable, he's really not a criminal. You know, when an aerospace engineer actually makes the use of composites in an aircraft to try to make sure that the aircraft becomes modern and viable, it's not a criminal. And fundamentally, what is driving everything is purely cost reduction. Okay? Nevertheless, when we're dealing with safety, cost reduction becomes immediately a negative connotation. And we're not allowed to admit that one of the very strong drivers of what we do is trying to shrink the cost of safety. The problem that we have in fire safety engineering, and one of the biggest issues today in fire safety engineering, that is clearly associated to sustainability, is the fact that we are completely overdimensioning our solutions. The problem of fire safety engineering is a problem that is already solved. Fires don't kill people. And we have to begin to understand that that problem was solved 40 years ago. We don't kill people, and by doing fire safety engineering, we're not saving lives. If we compare the losses of fire safety associated to the losses of any other area, it will be cars, it will be aircraft, it will be cancer, it will be whatever you want to talk about it. Whenever it deals with saving lives, our life losses are negligible. We're absolutely meaningless. We solved the problem. We dealt with it. You know? If we want to not talk about material losses, people will claim that, well, you know, fire safety engineering, you know, we, the losses on fire are enormous. That's absolute nonsense. The truth is that you have one hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, and that overrules the cost of, fire, of fires for a decade. If you have an earthquake in Japan, as you presented, immediately we overrule all the losses in fire for three decades. So we are negligible. Whatever way you look at it, the costs of fire are completely negligible. So we're not saving lives, and we're not saving money. The biggest cost of life is actually the fire service. You know, we are the only safety area in which we actually have a fire brigade. There's not a flood brigade or an earthquake brigade sitting there idle waiting for the event. Now, is it necessary or is it not necessary? That's not the problem. It is a cost. And that is a real one. And this is why you have the government pounding on the tables, screaming that we need to merge the fire brigades in Scotland. Why? Because they want to kill people? I mean, why, do they, why, why are they doing that? Why do they want to merge the fire service? Of course. Exactly. But they're allowed to, no? 
you know, they, they're fine. They're not criminals because they want to shrink the massive cost of the fire service. But we are when we say that we want to reduce fireproofing because we want to make the building cheaper. Nevertheless, equally safe. So what's the problem? So why is cost reduction such a huge problem in what we're doing? You know, why do we actually see the exercise of optimizing our resources as something so negative? <coughs> you know, why are we incapable of putting cost reduction in the same sentence than fire safety? <coughs> These are the things that we actually tend not to reflect, but that nevertheless are extremely important when we think of the future of our profession. We have to accept the fact that the problem is that the fire safety problem has been fundamentally solved. It is a problem that we learn to resolve, but at a great cost. The great cost is the fire service. The great cost is the massive amounts of water that we put in a building when we have to intervene. <coughs> fire service, sprinkler systems, the deluge system that you showed. What is the level of overdimensioning over that a sprinkler system has? The sprinkler system has a safety factor of the order of more than a thousand. You know what that means? We're throwing <coughs> one thousand times more water than we actually need. That's where the cost is. Now, when we insulate all these buildings and put fireproofing all over the place, and we require for a building that has no more combustibles that will burn more than 15 minutes, and we require a four hour fireproofing, that's a cost. What are we arguing against? We're saying, well, you know, uncertainty this and that and blah, blah, blah. And you heard all the problems. You know, your presentation lasted 45 minutes, but I can guarantee you that you can give a five-hour presentation of all the complexities of fire safety. Just take human behavior. You know, every single time that I hear people talk about human behavior, I cringe. Because I can say, well, I calculated the displacement distance of these people, and everybody, what, they, what would they say? Oh, yeah, but you didn't consider the pregnant woman time. You didn't consider the pregnant woman. You didn't consider the fat person that was climbing the stairs. You, know, you didn't consider the fact that the boss of the company decided that he was going to talk to his secretary before walking out into the stairs. Oh, well, those are the big uncertainties. Your number is pointless. You know, if I want to sit down and actually talk about what is complicated and difficult and absolutely intrinsically impossible to calculate about fire, I can spend a decade talking about it. You know, not 45 minutes, but hours. I can talk and talk and talk and throw all the problems. But the bottom line is that that's not the problem. The problem is fixed. I could care less what the uncertainty is. The problem is already taken care of. You know, we don't kill people in fires. We don't lose money in fires. You know, our buildings are safe. And on top of that, we put the fire brigade on top just in case something goes wrong. You can do whatever you want in this building. You know, you can decide to run the opposite direction that everybody is. You, know, you can decide to wait and sit down you know, until your mink coat is delivered as long as you want. I don't care. The problem is fixed. The problem of fire is not there. The problem of fire is in the cost. Fire costs too much. If we throw water, we throw a thousand times more than what we need. If we put fireproofing, we put ten times more than what we need. If we have smoke detection, we detect in an instant. You know, if we do egress paths, we make them way too big. You know, if we add stairs, we have way too many. Why? Because of the uncertainty, human behavior. Put another stair in the building. Okay? Every single time when we deal with fire, we always do the same thing. We overdimension, we overdimension, we overdimension, we overdimension. Okay? And that is really our problem. Every single thing that we do with fire is overdimensioning. No wonder why the architects hate us. <laughs> I mean, every single thing in the building we have constrained. Think about it. Maximum egress paths. All of a sudden, an architect is forced to basically never be able to walk beyond a certain distance. And every time they ask us, can I add a couple of meters? <laughs> no. You know, we cannot do it. <clears throat> Why? Because the rule says, what rule? The one that actually had a safety factor of 75? Because that's the problem. If you think of traveling distances, most likely to walk 30 meters or 60 meters or whatever your maximum travel distance is, then all of a sudden it becomes 
a ludicrous number compared to the rates at which a fire grows. But what do I have to account for? The massive uncertainty. So I put all that massive uncertainty, and then all of a sudden I plug it in there, and then everything else is solved because I have a massive safety factor. Okay? So then the architects say, well, okay, fine, I'll agree with the maximum travel distance. And then you say, ah, but now you have to ruin your really nice flat ceiling and fill it with sprinklers. Okay? And then they say, well, but can, can I avoid doing that? Uh -huh, no, no, you can't because, you know, there's uncertainty on how much fuel is going to be in there. And, you know, you're designing a building and you're putting all this fuel in there and that's considered your design load. But then all of a sudden, when we hand the building, as you said, Somebody's going to change it. So there's uncertainty. So what do we do? We stick a huge safety factor. Not only that, we don't want to spend money doing tests on sprinklers. So we force the architect to put a flat ceiling because we don't want to test tilted ceilings. So every building has to have a flat ceiling because if they don't have a flat ceiling, the sprinklers don't work. Okay? So I can actually say, well, you have to do flat ceilings. And then I can force an architect to put fire doors. But this is a historic building, and I have my 18th century doors there. They're about this wide. And we tell them, well, if you don't test them, they're not fireproof doors. So I have to put a really ugly metal door instead of your 17th century. That's overdimensioning. That's cost. That's what we're adding into the construction process. And no wonder why everybody dislikes us. Because everybody recognizes, except for us, that we're throwing everything away. <clears throat> our overdimensioning, our waste, is absolutely enormous. So fundamentally, the cost reduction is actually the only venue that we have to make our engineering better. If we don't embrace the idea of cost reduction and we introduce <coughs> into the sentence the concept of cost reduction, then all of a sudden, what are we doing? Let's just go back to prescription, put everything exactly as prescribed, overdimension everything, and ignore the whole thing. But can we do better? And that's really the question. Can we do better? That's when you will go, I'm going to say, well, yes, I need to optimize. But how can I optimize? What do I need to do to be able to optimize? What is essential if you're trying to optimize? It is absolutely essential to have quantitative performance of the systems. If I cannot establish how long is it going to take for you to get out of the building, if I cannot establish and quantify how long is it going to take for the fire to grow, if I cannot quantify how long is it going to take for a structure to fail, then I cannot optimize because I have implicit safety factors. The factors of safety are absolutely implicit, and therefore I have no idea what they are. So how can I cut them without compromising the safety? So I have all these numbers, I know my system works, and I know it works because simply so overdimensioned that it has to work. Okay? But I have no idea where is the big overdimensioning? Where is the small overdimensioning? Okay? Where are the big gains and where are the small gains? I'm not going to go and run you know, 25,000 hours of FDS to basically reduce 1% of the fan flow rate in a smoke extraction system. That's a waste. Okay? But all of a sudden, maybe I can do just a very basic hand calculation and show that you can take off 25% of the fireproofing. That's a big gain. Okay? But if we're working on implicit values, on implicit performance, we're never going to be able to optimize. We're always going to be guessing what's right and what's wrong. But what does it take to optimize? So now, if I, say, if I accept that I have to be able to quantify the safety factors, that I have to be able to give numbers that enables me to know where the fat is. What do I need to do to be able to deliver those numbers? I have to know how to calculate. Now, the problem is incredibly complicated. Okay? And I'm not going to deny it. Fire is an incredibly complicated problem. Now, there's many other very complicated problems. 
you know, the human body is a very complicated problem, and our doctors more or less seem to keep us alive. Okay? They actually know how to handle it in certain ways. If you look at people that, for example, are addressing the design of underground tunnels, designing a tunnel under the water is an incredibly complicated problem. Nevertheless, we can deliver it. Designing a one kilometer tall building for extreme wind loads is an incredibly complicated problem. Nevertheless, we deal with it. Is fire much worse than that? I mean, why do we always have to focus on what we don't know how to do? You know, engineers figured out this problem a long time ago. It's a safety factor. Okay? So when we have uncertainty, when we have lack of knowledge, we put a safety factor. If we're completely ignorant, our safety factor is huge. If we are very knowledgeable, we can optimize and shrink that safety factor. When do we do an exercise where we're actually looking into seeing how far can we bring that safety factor down? That's what optimization is. It is not using the tools beyond their capabilities, which is what we're doing very often now. We take a tool, and because the tool is there, and I have to give an answer to the client, what do we do? I run FDS. I run a final element model. I do this and that. And then all of a sudden, I get what the client wants. Okay? That's not optimization. Optimization is to use the right tool for the right problem in such a way that you can get the right level of quantification of the problem. There's absolutely no point in getting an answer to the fifth decimal point using a CFD solution if your input variables are of the order of magnitude of one. Okay? That is the wrong use of tools. So we mistake optimization by the use of sophisticated tools. And we forget that we are not thinking. We have tools. Each tool has an error bar. Each tool has a level of precision. Each tool is used for a certain purpose. Okay? And when we combine those tools, we can give an answer to a certain level of uncertainty. And at that point, we stick a quantifiable safety factor. That's what engineers do. That's not what fire safety engineers do. What fire safety engineers do is either one of two things. One, either they do prescription, where they get an implicit safety factor, and they basically close their eyes to the waste. I'm not going to complain that those implicit safety factors give me a certain level of confidence because history proves us that. All the statistics show that we have solved the fire safety problem. <coughs> Prescription actually does work, even in the very extreme scenarios. You know, we only have very unique massive failures that have happened that we can count with the fingers of my hand. Okay? But we don't have the consistent failures that happen all the time that prove that our methods are wrong. You know, we are overdimensioning everything and we have fixed the problem that way. But we decide to ignore the waste. That's the one thing we do. We decide to ignore the waste by living with implicit safety factors. On the other hand, we kid ourselves that we're solving the problem, quantifying things, because we're using sophisticated tools. Instead of actually really looking at the tools we have and see what is the right level of optimization that I want to achieve and how much I can cut off the safety factor so that actually I do an optimization which is within the bounds of our knowledge. Okay? We can calculate fires. We can calculate fires extremely well in all its complexity, but to a certain level of precision. It's about knowing a number and its error bars. It's not about getting the right answer. If I have an approximate number and a sense of the error bars, I can put a safety factor that covers for that uncertainty. And that's the part that we don't do. We went straight into the big complicated tools without even understanding what goes inside. When we have an entire array of incredibly useful engineering tools that enables us to work step by step through the problem, but at each stage add an uncertainty that adds a safety factor, but that is quantifiable and therefore can be optimized. So in a way, the cost reduction should be our motivation. That's what we're doing. We are reducing costs. Okay? That is the one thing where fire safety engineering can allow us to gain. Okay? It is not because we're going to save more lives. It is not because we're going to save more property. It is because we are wasting everything. 
we are putting, we have a very wasteful profession that actually is putting an enormous amount of resources in solving a problem to a level that has safety factors that are enormous. Now, if we want to optimize the, the solution, then we can actually work with our tools. We, can, we don't have to focus all the time on what we don't know. We don't have to permanently focus on the uncertainty that overrules us and precludes us from getting answers. We actually have answers to many of the questions. We can deliver excellent answers to many of the questions, but we have to use the right tools. And I think this is what engineering is all about. It's an exercise where we optimize our resources to get the best possible outcome. The more knowledgeable we are, the better engineers we are, the more capable we are to use the whole array of tools that we have to provide the best possible solution that makes sure that optimizes the ensemble, optimizes the hours that I use as an engineer, optimizes the materials that were in, in, introduced in the system, <coughs> simplifies the management of the building so that management is not a huge issue. You know, many times we get these incredibly sophisticated solutions that all of a sudden require a high level of management that bottom line, at the end of the day, never work. Okay? And we can put all the incredibly sophisticated fast response alarms and suppression systems and whatever, but if they're not managed and maintained properly, they will never work. Is that an optimized solution? No, that's using the extreme tool for the wrong problem. Okay? We can come up with a robust, solid, optimized solution that, for example, can minimize the uncertainty associated to management. And we can work with that solution to try to deliver something that is actually quite optimized. So the bottom line is that fire safety and optimization, as much as cost reduction, are inherently in the same sentence. And it's absolutely essential that we actually embrace these two concepts if we are ever going to be talking about sustainability. Because at the end of the day, we have two ways of looking at sustainability. What is the impact that we have on our environment if there is a fire? That's very simple to quantify. What are you going to do? Basically take all the fire events historically, calculate the costs, calculate the carbon footprint of all those losses, calculate all the pollution that you want, whatever you want, and make an integral over time. Okay? And then compare it to the pollution produced by cars the losses used by tsunamis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and where do we land? Negative. Okay? Our impact on the environment as a polluting agent, as an energy consumption system, anything that is associated to the flames is negligible. Anything associated to the losses is negligible. Where is our impact in the whole equation of sustainability? Where does it really matter? In the fact that we're not optimizing and therefore we're wasting. So we're behaving as extremely poor engineers. Our job is to optimize the use of resources and what we're doing is wasting everybody else's resources. That's why we're not sustainable. Okay? We're completely unsustainable because fundamentally we have a, a solution that is one size fits all. Implicit safety factor. So inherently, there's a safety factor that is so much bigger than every possible uncertainty underneath. So you're taking the worst possible uncertainty and fixing your safety factor there. One solution fits all the sizes. End of the story. And then when we're actually trying to do something, we don't focus on what we have to focus because it's a swear word to try to reduce costs. Oh, we're killing people. You know? It's a swear word to try to optimize because, oh, that's unsafe. Okay? And instead, what are we focusing in? Why do we do a smoke management calculation using a sophisticated tool? You know, why do we try to figure out using a complex final element model why a building is coming down? Why do we do that? <clears throat> Does the precision of the building merit that? What is the point of doing an RSET versus ACET calculation if the available safe egress time I can calculate as a physical model, but the required saved egress time has an error bar that is the size of this room. Why? Because human behavior cannot predict, cannot be predicted. You cannot predict human behavior. So what's the point of doing an ACID versus RSID? 
Why are we doing all these things? I mean, what's the point of doing a CFD calculation of smoke management if we have no idea how the flow in a fan operates? You know, we have a little curve of how the fan operates. That's the precision of the tool. It was a test that was done on the fan that is incredibly simplistic, that produces a global number that is basically RPMs versus flow rate. That's our input variable. So what's the point for me to refine centimeter cells in a CFD code <coughs> if my source is one number that covers the entire ensemble of the fan? I'm not modeling the blades to see how the flow creates in there and all that. Why am I doing it? I mean, this is the part that people forget to, to understand. It's like, why are we doing all these calculations? Are we trying to optimize? Are we trying to do an engineering cost reduction? I mean, that's why we're doing it. This is why this is a swear word. Because we're using all the tools that we have in an inappropriate manner for the inappropriate reasons. Because we want to justify our existence in front of a client. Client comes and says, I want this. And we go and run and do all these things, give them the answer. But it's not because we want to do better engineering. It is because we are forced nowadays to give an answer. We cannot say no. In the past, when we had prescriptive rules and we had accepted our waste as something that was necessary, if we didn't comply with the rules, we said, no, you cannot do that. Today, we've opened the gates. How can we tell the client no? We have to use all our tools to be able to deliver to the client what they want. But are we actually doing engineering? We're not. We're basically just simply working as mercenaries to somebody that wants to achieve another objective. Okay? And that is really the problem. We have to take back our profession. And we have to try to understand what the value of what we're doing is. We have an array of tools that is fundamentally linked to our knowledge. We have a knowledge base that is incredibly powerful, that can actually give very good answers at very different levels. So then don't tell me that I have to run a CFD because the client wants to see a pretty picture. <coughs> That's absolute nonsense if the tool is the wrong tool for the problem. I am running a CFD if I need it. If I need to resolve a heat transfer point for a connection in a corner where it's absolutely imperative, that's when I will run a CFD analysis. Not to actually do a ventilation study in a tunnel where CFD is absolutely ludicrous. But it gives me pretty pictures. I can resolve the mirrors of the trucks. <clears throat> That's what we do. So what are we doing? Sustainability is taking our profession away from us. Basically, these are the drivers that are basically pushing us in a certain direction. And we're completely incapable of understanding that what we're doing is basically complying to something that is not what engineering is all about. It's not about using pretty tools. It's not about wasting your time using pretty tools because the client wants to see a pretty picture. It is about reducing costs to optimize the use of our resources. We want to deliver a level of safety that is acceptable. We want to save lives. And we can do it in many ways. We can do it by wasting resources and being unsustainable, or we can do it by optimizing our resources. But for that, we need to be careful that we properly use our engineering tools. So fundamentally, when you think of this, fire safety is a perfect example of sustainability. <coughs> fire safety is a discipline that affects every aspect of the built environment. If you want to design security in a building, that's going to affect egress. If you want to design structures, that's going to be affected by fire. If you want to design heat and ventilation and air conditioning systems, that is going to define, be defined by smoke management. If you want to design even the status <coughs> of the building, it's going to, the space is going to affect the fire growth, and therefore fire is going to affect the definition of space. Every aspect, even water supply, is going to be involved with sprinkler systems and water management in the case of waste. Every single thing that you do in the built environment is in one way or another one affected by fire safety. And we have the options. We have the option of doing proper engineering and behaving like engineers, or we have the option of basically either wasting the resources that everybody else has, or simply just 
comply because somebody else wants to use something. Now, I'll give you a very simple example, you know, just to wrap up this discussion, which is the example of the green materials. Okay, you talked about green engineering. This is something that has affected the fire engineering community in a very, very deep manner. Okay? All of a sudden, we developed in the last 25 years an entire fire safety strategy that is based on the use of fire retardants. Okay? Plastics were introduced into buildings in many different ways in the construction process, sandwich panels, for example, you know, in furniture, in carpets. And how did we make all this viable? We introduced fire retardants. Okay? <coughs> Fair enough. That was the solution to the time. We put clean chemicals into it, we fix the problem. Now, the consequence of that is that we enabled something to happen, which is the permeation of polymers into the entire constructive process. All of a sudden, we have plastics everywhere, from fiber-reinforced polymers all the way to sofas and beds. Okay? So now we have plastics everywhere. So what happens then? Somebody quantifies the cost of plastics. That's what they did, no? So what is the cost of plastics? The cost of plastics is their carbon footprint and the pollution that is introduced by the fire retardants. The environmentalists immediately start behaving as engineers and they quantify it. They found phosphates in whales, you know, they found brominating bromin <coughs> compounds in breast milk. They quantified all the things and they link it all to fire retardants. They made up their case in a quantitative manner, this is what we are polluting. Okay? And they presented to the public opinion, and the public opinion all of a sudden said, fair enough, wipe them out. What did we do? What did we do? We just went along with it. Hmm? We just went along with it. Why? Why did we went along with it? <coughs> we didn't challenge the numbers. But were the numbers wrong? Maybe not. Maybe not, no. I mean, they did all the calculations and they found all the evidence of all these chemicals within all the situations. Even in some cases, and you can debate that, some of these chemicals were difficult to trace back to fire retardants, but, you know, we can argue this in a technical way. But that's not why we lost the battle. We arrived at the train station before the train, after the train had already left. Okay, and why did that happen? We don't care. But, but, you know, it's not true because we actually do care. We, you know, you heard, you know, the president of IFE talking about fire retardants. We care. You know, it's literally messing our entire business. Because we built such a factor of safety into the retardants. So, the, it's the opposite. You know, the fire retardants built the factor of safety. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, once we put fire retardants, we reduced the flammability of all the materials, and what was the consequence? Basically, we could spread them all over the place and it was fine. Problem fixed, we solved it. Okay? Now, how did we guarantee that we solved the problem? We gave a very simple, straight line solution to the industry. Okay? We're going to measure the heat release rate. Okay? So you go there, put your little sample, and if the peak heat release rate doesn't get to this number, or if your upward flame spread doesn't go that fast, you're done. No? Prescriptive solution. Implicit safety factor. We have no idea how the fire retardants work. We have no idea what they do to the material. We have absolutely no idea, actually, how they work in reality. We cannot even quantify what the benefit of the fire retardants is. We have no idea. We cannot even extrapolate <coughs> forward what the fire retardant does to the real fire. But we had a perfect solution. Give the industry two numbers that are so big Okay? That it doesn't matter. We don't have to think anymore. We stop being engineers, all of a sudden, we handed everything to the technicians, and the polymer industry was delighted. They didn't have to spend a penny on fire engineering, all they have to do is come up with a formulation that meets those two numbers, we're done. Okay? But that was perfectly fine when the benefit could be assessed and there was no cost. So what was the, the whole objective of optimization of the plastics industry, find the formulation of fire retardant that gave me exactly the same performance at the cheapest cost. No? That's what they did. So they had to come up with some chemicals 
that they could reduce the quantity, reduce the cost, and come up with something that effectively gave me the same two numbers, but nevertheless cost me less. And they went through with this for about 30 years. And they got there. You know, they literally enabled extremely cheap fire retardant materials that populate pretty much everything that we do today. So that was the evident cost, the cost of production, the one that came out right there. But what was the cost that came up after that trumped everything? The environmental cost. All of a sudden, a new cost comes in. And that new cost trumps entirely everything else that we have. All of a sudden, we have a situation in which we are being told, you are too expensive. But not too expensive from a monetary terms, but too expensive from the perspective of sustainability. Okay? Could we respond? Our legal framework, all that they asked was for those two numbers. So in a framework of implicit safety factors, we could not respond. It's impossible. Okay? Because the answer was already there. They met the criteria. So we had to respond as engineers. And to be able to respond as engineers, what did we do? What did we have to do? We had to be able to scale up the fire. We have to be able to use our tools, put them together to demonstrate the benefit so that we could see if the cost balanced the benefit. All we had to do was make sure that we understood how these fire retardants actually perform in real fires. So we could describe to the rest of the world, if you take those things away, you know, it's not about killing this number of people, but it's going to be killing about this number of people. Okay? We're saving lives. Okay? Can we optimize it? Maybe. If we understand how to scale it up, then we can actually optimize the process to deliver the desired output at a minimum cost to the environment. That is a sustainable solution. Instead, what we did? We thought about our precision. Oh, some people did things with some tools, other people did things with some tools. They, come, they come, argued against each other. And instead of giving a solution that was robust, that still carried a safety factor, but allowed me to quantify the benefit so that I could contrast it against the cost, we sat there arguing among ourselves. Okay? And the train left the station. Now it's gone. And the same way we have allowed two, three, four, five returns to go away, there will be seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve going away in the near future. And we still haven't woken up. You know, I can use many examples like that. You can talk about flammable materials inside sandwich panels as opposed to non-flammable insulation. You talked about that. What's the problem of using polymers in sandwich panels? What's the problem? They both pass the test. And actually, the, the sandwich panels do, in many cases, much better than the non-flammable insulation. So what's the problem? With our existing framework of implicit performance, we cannot distinguish between the two of them. But we know there's a problem, or there's toxic gases. But where is that in a failure criteria? What we need to do is engineering. We need to understand what the concept of a fire barrier is. The concept of a fire barrier is to prevent fire and smoke to leave a compartment. That's the principle of compartmentation. No? That's what it is. And you can read it in every life safety code. That's the principle of a fire barrier. That in the past, we translated to a test that required a little flame to escape as the failure criteria. But that test of implicit performance was designed for non-flammable barriers. But we forgot how to think. We forgot how to be engineers. And we're sitting there banging our table. Why are people putting all these flammable systems together and having to meet exactly the same criteria as another non-flammable system? The plastics industry is much more sustainable in these terms. They have a much lower thermal conductivity, much lower weight. They're highly competitive when the only variables that are being used are those of green buildings. And what are we doing? 
We're sitting there banging our heads, ignoring the facts that we should be engineers. So at the end, if you really think about this presentation, and if you really think about the title, <coughs> this is it. At the end, fire safety integrally belongs in the sentence. Fire safety is all about optimizing our resources. That implies a cost <coughs> reduction, and that by consequence makes you sustainable. But unfortunately, we have a very complicated problem that has an enormous amount of extremely interesting tools, some of them more precise than other ones, some of them better than other ones. Okay? But you know what is, what is required to be able to use those tools as an engineer? An engineer. Okay? And that's the problem that we have. We have stopped behaving as engineers, and we're basically being driven by all the other variables. And the moment we actually take our profession back in our hands, and we actually start behaving as engineers, and thinking as engineers, and learning as engineers, at that point, we're going to be talking about sustainable fire safety engineering. Before that, all we're going to be doing <coughs> is servicing the client, and optimization and cost reduction will remain as swear words. Thank you.